All right, with this uh, technology, we'll get going here. And I'd like to speak this uh, evening and on the Lord is able. There's a song we sing sometimes on He is able to deliver thee, speaking of saving us from our sins and if we're faithful, of course, saving us in heaven. But I would like for us to consider that at several points that we note about what he is able to do to set the scene almost 2,000 years ago in the eastern end of the Mediterranean and the eastern part of the Roman Empire, a little place not much bigger than New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, on a mountain in Galilee, and the mountain itself was unnamed, an itinerant preacher who had been put to death, but had been raised from the dead, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, told his disciples, as the King James reads, all power, American standard authority, hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. Sometimes we quote that so much in the Lord's church, getting to the point that it's Christ that saves us by his power, and his power is in the gospel, Romans 1, 16, that it becomes commonplace to us. But think of all the powerful things in this world, and none of them can save us from our sins, only Jesus, because he has the power or authority to save us. And I think this is forcefully illustrated when he took the law of Moses out of the way. As the scripture says, he wrote to the church in Colossae, he took the law out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2, 14 through 15. Now, triumph was celebrated by the Romans when they conquered somebody or had won some great important battle. They were allowed, their generals were, to have a triumph. So Christ is pictured in that way, and the people of that time would understand perfectly well what was being said when the word triumphing over them in it, that is, spoiled principalities and powers. So Jesus willingly suffered on the cross of Calvary. And here's what it says. And we'll make some points that have been made in Ken's class in Hebrews throughout this little talk. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2.15. Those are words of comfort to Christians especially persecuted Christians who are persecuted because of their faithful obedience to Christ, and their teaching of the gospel. And we raise the question at this point, now why did Jesus die? Well, John writes to Christians in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, and simply says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, I said our point is, is that he is able. And I would say, when you look at these verses, he's still able to do just exactly what those inspired scriptures say. And we should take comfort in those, and we should let a world that's gone mad over material things and self realize those things end, and they have no long-term eternal blessings in them. They're just the pleasures of sin for a season. So out of those things, I want to notice a few other things concerning what he's able to do. Number one, and this draws directly out of what we've already said, he's able to save mankind. Again, going back to the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 7, verse 25, notice our term able, and then this is the scripture. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, at the time that the letter of the Hebrews, in fact, the whole of the New Testament was written, the church was already established. 
But the unbelieving Jews were still going to the temple. They were still doing all they thought the law taught them to do. But that didn't work anymore. That wasn't going to be the permanent way. That was not because only Christ is able. And it's through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him, John 14, 6. It was awful hard for a lot of Jews to get out of, get in their head. That's the first thing. He's able to save mankind. Number two, he's able to provide all grace. Grace meaning favor. Something we don't deserve. In fact, we deserve punishment. But because God favors us, we don't get what we deserve. Paul wrote about this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Now notice again, and God is able, able to make all grace abound toward you as Christians. That ye, you Christians, always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. Again, 1 Corinthians 9, 8. So there's nothing good that's really good, as God defines good, that's withheld from God's children. Sometimes that means us being tested, our faith, that is, in God and in righteous things being put to the test. Sometimes, like Abraham, we just don't know where we are with God until our faith is put to the test and we see. It may be like Abraham, we're strong. It may be like Peter, we may have boasted, but then we stumbled, but we go through it, and sometimes we have to take the course again. But he's able, in the whole system he's ordained, to take that person who earnestly desires to serve him, obey him, withhold nothing back from being his servant, and make it all work. You say, how? Well, I don't know how. I don't really care. He's promised me enough in his word to say he's able to save mankind. He's able to provide all grace a favor. And number three, he's able to succor those who are tempted. Back to the Hebrew letter and all this before he studied Hebrews 2.18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. Watch it. He is able to succor them that are tempted. Now, to me, that's very comforting. It's uh, peaceful. It's sweet to know, if you want to put it that way. That Jesus knows, he comprehends, he's compassionate, he understands, he cares, and he will succor us in such times of need. When you think about all that you've been through in your life, some of us a lot more than others, but we've been here longer. But when you think about, well, today they came out and said inflation's at a 40-year high, 9.1% or something and uh, stock markets going down and all these different things that materialists love, and it just drives them up the wall. It doesn't affect any of these things. The only thing that can affect any of these things is our lack of faith in Christ as his word teaches it. Well, then he's made able, and this is a full point, to make a stand, to make a stand. He can do that not only when everything's going fine, as I think it is right now, but in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of trial, especially that which comes upon us because we serve God, because we preach the truth, because we defend the faith, because we will not compromise. And like the three Hebrew children of long ago in that fire furnace, they wouldn't bend and they wouldn't bow and they wouldn't burn. Paul wrote along this line to the church in Rome in Romans 14, 4, and he said, Yea, he shall be holding up. Here it is again. For God is able to make him stand. Saints of God are never forsaken. He's always with us as we love and keep his commandments, as we're striving, we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Well, I can't see him, I can't hold his hand literally. I can't hear him speak to me, but I know what he says in the Bible, and I know what he promises, and he keeps his promises. So we're never forsaken. And then point five I want to make is that he is able to keep us from falling. 
Some of these you see overlap. But nevertheless, I like that. You know, it's said that as we get older, and some of us have, that we get more fearful of falling. You know, the outward man may be perishing, and it is, but the inward man is renewed day by day. Don't have to worry about falling there if I will keep his commandment. Now listen to Jude, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Does that sound like protection? You know, this time of year and a little later on, you got all this stuff coming out. And how many times I see these um, insurance, what is it? From 55 to 85 or 50 to 85, you get, I don't know how much money they promise you in that life insurance, but for what, 995, you're able to get so much. Well, that's a kind of form of protection, isn't it? But this is not what we're talking about, and that's not what the Bible talks about, and our hope ought to be built on the kind of ability that Jesus had. And notice the sixth point. He's able to subdue all things. He can lead, and he does, and he guides, and he protects us. See, the overlapping with to keep from falling and to make us stand. And notice what he said to the Philippians. According to the working whereby he is able, even to subdue all things unto himself, Philippians 3.21. Well, maybe losing in the stock market, but if you're faithful to the Lord with Christ, you're a winner every time. You never lose. And then point seven, Christ is able to safeguard all who are entrusted to him, that is, for him to save them. Paul wrote to Timothy and said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, and here it is again, he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1, verse 12 again. Now, that's saying there's no use for anxiety and worry. There's no reason for fear. No eternal loss possible as we love the Lord and keep his commandments. That's what we're busy about. And then the eighth one, he's able to perform all that he promises to do. So our faith can be assured, as was the father of the faithful, patriarch Abraham, which says of him, Abraham being fully persuaded that what he had promised, listen, he was able to perform. Romans 4, 21. So the Lord is faithful. We don't have to worry about what he's going to do or not do. What he said he would do, he'll do it. Our concern should be our love of him, our faith in him based on his word, and our determination to keep his commandments that come what may. And then the last point under our Lord is able, this is point nine if you keep keeping count, he's able to do above all we ask or think. Think of how many prayers we offer to God. Ask him to strengthen us, to bless us, to help us in some way or another, to aid us. Because we want to be faithful. We want to get through this, that, or the other, faithful to him. Well, listen to what he had to say to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now to him, listen, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Well, how does God's power pertain to our salvation work in you and me? Well, the power to save is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the New Testament system. And thus back to 1 Corinthians 1558, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He is able. So here are words of the Bible that's designed to lift us up, 
keep us going on. When we stumble, we get up. We don't quit. When we hurt, we don't stop. When we make a blunder some way or the other, then we back off and hit it again. But we just don't quit. We keep studying. We keep teaching. We keep correcting ourselves. We keep trusting in God, for he will never waver. He will never change. He is always, in the present tense, the great I am that I am. Thus, he is able. Hope that's helpful. Thank you very much.